following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio, streaming, and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for navigating the madness of mental health, using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. After a unintended extra week off, it's once again another week where I have to contextualize things with global events. In the greater Toronto area, where this show is recorded, a great many families are fearing for the safety of loved ones in Israel and the Gaza Strip right now. The Toronto area is home to many Jewish and Arab people, and the news coming out of the outbreak of war has been horrifying and angering and it can be very hard to talk about that conflict without things spiraling out of control. But some others of you, you listening, you don't care, or you can't care. It's too hard to watch, too hard to think about. And that's okay. This isn't a current event show. I'm feeling affected by it, but I'm going to do a show about general communication. Because it'll help talk about all kinds of things. Easy things, difficult things. Some people don't find any conversation easy. For some people, talking at all is difficult. Before the most recent tragedy, I'd been hearing from clients that they struggled to start up conversations with new people. That was the original point of this show. And returning guest Kevin Bennett, PhD, social personality psychology professor and host of the Kevin Bennett is Snarling podcast will be here to talk to us about starting conversations with strangers in the interview. But first, I want to talk about why we communicate. Because this may seem obvious, but we don't all do it for the same reasons. A lot of people communicate to be heard, which is a totally understandable goal, but not totally within our control. We know what I think about that. Top 10 phrase, healthy goals are based on things you can control. Again, nothing wrong with wanting to be heard. Just keep in mind, you can't control it, not completely. Now, some other people communicate well, this may sound strange, but when I've asked some people on social media why they said something nasty to me, they said, I didn't think you'd respond. They were just throwing stuff out there because reasons to exist, to make noise. They didn't think their words put out in public would have an impact. Maybe they just did it to temporarily make themselves feel better about something I don't think it worked. Other people communicate to get stuff, to make people like them. This is a primarily transactional form of communication and not very emotionally fulfilling, even though most of us have to do it some of the time. I'm really bad at this form of communication. It is not my forte. I'm the type of person who communicates to learn and connect. Because learning about people is something that's in your control. You can't force someone to hear and understand you. You can hope they hear and understand you, but you can't force them to. You can make sure that you hear and understand other people. Now, some people find this whole concept to be a disappointing proposition. They want to be heard. When is it their turn? I get it. But think of it this way. If everyone wants to talk and no one wants to listen, no one is likely to get heard. People like other people who are good listeners. People like me who are professional communicators spend the majority of our time listening because you have to listen well to be effective when you do speak. And listening has shown me how little other people listen. People often talk past each other and very little meaning is exchanged. Or worse, people read in things that aren't there. They add and subtract to the communication to respond to what they're afraid of, not what was said. 
This single bad habit leads to a huge number of misunderstandings, which is why another of my top 10 phrases is, listen twice before you talk once. I love that one. I love all of them, but I love that one special. So many of us are stuck in patterns formed when we were emotionally abused in the past. And it's very easy to be hypervigilant if we've come up in an environment where you couldn't trust that people said what they meant and meant what they said. But making a promise to yourself that you are going to be authentic in your communications goes so far towards getting better for yourself. Being authentic doesn't mean being overly blunt or rude. It means understanding yourself and really feeling your feelings. So yeah, it's a process of trial and error that isn't always fun, but it's worth it. Trust is not something that can be rushed in relationships, but I'm already getting ahead of myself. We should start with how conversations start in the first place, which is what my returning guest is here to talk about. Short opening segment. This, this week, Kevin Bennett, PhD, social personality psychology professor and host of the Kevin Bennett is Snarling podcast, will be here to talk to us about starting conversations with strangers after the break. You're not going to want to miss this. That's a radio cliche, isn't it? But it's true. You're not going to want to miss this one. Leanna at Not Therapy Show. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the website, Not Therapy Show, you can join the mailing list there or at Not Therapy Show on X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, and threads. We'll be back with Kevin Bennett after this, talking to strangers. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. And it's time for the interview with a returning guest. I'm super excited to have Kenan, Kevin Bennett PhD, should have warmed up my mouth again, Uh, teaching professor of social personality psychology at Penn State University and the host of Kevin Bennett is Snarling, a psychology podcast for chronic overanalyzers. When Kevin was on the show last time, the podcast was about to start. So Kevin, congratulations on the launch of Kevin Bennett is Snarling, and we're very happy to have you back on It's Not Therapy. Well, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be back. I'm glad to talk with you again. Yeah, and we're develop- we're showing communication skills because you wrote an article on psychology today about starting conversations with strangers. And on the topic of communication, this is one that freaks a lot of people out. It's a really simple thing. And yet at the same time, it's a cold start, which a lot of people who are over analyzers like your podcast deals with, that's a very, very hard barrier to breach going from nothing to something so how do you recommend people start these conversations with strangers well it's a great question and it's i wrote the article not because i'm an expert on conversations but because it's something that i struggle with you know i think about all these people that i want to talk to and sometimes i get stuck just coming up with the very beginning. What do you do at the very beginning of a conversation? And so uh, sometimes I'll just skip it. And there's some recent research now that's saying the same thing, that a lot of people just avoid conversations entirely because starting one is the hardest part and they can't get over the anxiety uh, about that. And I think a lot of people overanalyze things at that point. But uh, you know, having a conversation with somebody that you don't know, that is a stranger, uh, it in many ways, it's a dying art form, but it's not dead yet. And I, I think we need to work hard to revive it because it's it's that important. There's so many things that we get from face-to-face conversations with people that we don't know. I mean, there's a whole world of unknown information. You're never going to know unless you have that conversation. So uh, I outlined a few steps in the article that I wrote recently. And the first thing that I encourage all people to do is to approach any new conversation with openness. Don't prejudge at all. Don't have any assumptions about what that person is going to think about you or what they're going to be like. Just be very open. And that involves some nonverbal 
behaviors as well, like, uh, you know, maintaining eye contact and trying to smile as much as possible, even if you're not a real, you know, smiley kind of person, you know, try to try to get the smile out there because it, it has a big impact on, on the dynamics, on the emotional tone of the conversation. Uh, so the more positive you can be, especially at the beginning of a conversation, uh, I, I think the better off you'll be in the long run. So how do you actually get the conversation going? Uh, if you have an obvious opening, something that you have in common with this person or some kind of connection, that's a, that's a great thing. I would go with that. If you can't think of anything, uh, you know, you can start with a, an icebreaker and it doesn't have to be something that's just uh, worn out and tired that we're, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're bored with, you're tired of hearing like, uh, you know, what do you do for a living? Uh, where are you from? You know, those are common ones and those are okay. If you don't have anything else and you're comfortable with that, you know, just say, Hey, what do you, what do you do? And, uh, you know, where, where are you from? That sort of thing. Uh, if you want something more creative, you can ask questions like, uh, what do you, what are you passionate about? I think that's a great, great question. Tell me something you're passionate about or what's the best book you've read ever or recently, or what's a you know great TV show that you're, you're watching right now. Uh, I had a, a, a friend at work here who's now my friend. He was just my colleague not too long ago and I didn't really know him, but he came up to me after a meeting and uh, he's, he asked me, uh, who's your favorite psychologist? And I was, I, I stopped in my tracks because it's like, I've never been asked that question in all these years. And it was such an interesting question. And it was, it was so much better than just, Hey, what, you know, how's it going? And what are you, uh, you know, what are you teaching this semester? It was like, what are you, what are you passionate about? Who is your favorite psychologist? Um, so creative questions like that sometimes mildly surprise people. And that's great to get a conversation going because usually people smile and they might have nervous laughter and then they start talking. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. One of my favorite ones is who's your favorite Batman villain? Not much oh. different than who's your favorite psychologist. I don't think. <laughs> no, that's a great one. I, I love those questions that are, that are pretty focused, pretty specific, right? Who's your yeah. favorite Batman villain? They've got to be enough. They've got to be, you know, mass awareness enough that people don't go, who? You know, but everybody knows Batman. Everybody probably knows the Marvel characters. And so starting off that way, if somebody goes, I don't watch it. Okay, that's a conversation starter in itself. Right, but, exactly. Yeah. The other thing I find, and, and tell me if this is consistent with what you found in terms of appearing open is asking for recommendations. If you're at a restaurant or a bar, ask for, you know, what's good on the menu or what, you know, what drink did they try? Was it any good? Especially without those cocktails, you know, those white claw type oh, things. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've drank a lot of really disgusting coolers like that just to start conversations with someone. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you ordering? Is it good? Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, I'll try it. Yeah, this is gross. But now I started talking to someone. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And you I, know what that, go, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, when you ask somebody a question like that, it also puts them in the, the position of expert for the moment, right? Because right? you're asking them, hey, you know, that you, you seem to know what you're doing here. You know what's happening. What are you drinking or what are you eating? And people like to give, most people like to give recommendations, uh, especially if it's from somebody who thinks, hey, you know, this, this person likes me. They think that I'm smart and I'll share my information with them. It's great. Yeah, I actually got that advice from an MBA. He said, people love to give advice. So if you want to approach somebody, don't ask them for anything but advice. It's like, all right, I'll try that. It, it was foreign to me at the time, but it's worked really well. But I think that comes into your next step of once you've got them talking, you actually have to listen. And this is a part that, I, you know, and I say, say on the show all the time, listen twice before you talk once, because I find a lot of people are so busy anticipating their chance to talk that they don't actually listen. So they're listening to respond, not listening to understand. And I mean, to me, that causes two problems. One, you're not actually paying attention to the person it's going to show. Two, the anxiety of trying to think and listen at the same time ups that overanalyzing, ups the stress. And 
affects that body language you you talked about how'd i do with that one yeah they, that absolutely there's a real rhythm to conversations if they're going well and it involves everyone has to play a role and you're actually playing multiple roles so, you know when you're talking you're you're hopefully saying something interesting or funny but the other person should be listening uh, and and that's not always the case because like you said, some people are just thinking about what they're going to say next, which is really kind of a selfish way to go through conversations or to participate in conversations. Uh, you should be listening and then you can tailor your response to whatever the person just said. Um, and I mean, that it seems really simple when you, when you actually talk about how to talk, uh, but I think it needs to be said, and we all need to remember or remind ourselves that, okay, this is how I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to listen and then respond to a specific specific thing that the person said. Um, and I think the number one trait in in having a good conversation is to be curious, to be genuinely curious, not kind of this superficial, like, oh, I'm so curious about what you're doing, but try to make it feel like it's really genuine and ask questions that say, that indicate, hey, I, I'm, I'm truly interested in what you just said. And I have some follow-up questions so I can help, you know, it'll help me understand it better. I, people, people really like that because mm -hmm. again, you're putting them in the role of, of expert and you're saying, this is fascinating. Tell me a little bit more. Um, and most people do like that. So I'd say curiosity and active listening are absolutely crucial. Yeah, that that's something about keeping conversations going. People tend to say to me, well, I don't know what to say. And it's like, just ask why. Why do you think that? Why did you feel that? Why did you get into that? Because why is a good open ended question? There's no wrong answers. And, you know, it 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 all it requires nothing of you as a listener. You're just prompting them to talk again. And is there any reason not to do that? Uh, not to ask why yeah. in conversations. Yeah. Well, not that I can think of unless mm. you, I, I, well, if you reach Maybe the not point why where did you go to prison, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. You do have to pay attention to the, the, the context a little bit and, um, being, being curious and asking follow-ups are good, but we all have to learn what that point is where you, you stop and you move on to a different topic, right? You don't want to over probe and keep asking why, why, why. Right. Uh, and that's just something you learn through practice and in conversation, like any other skill uh, gets better with practice. And the only way you'll improve is to practice. So if we just keep texting and avoiding conversations, we're not practicing and perfecting that, that skill that I think previous generations had an easier time doing because they had to talk all the time you know, starting at a very early age. So uh, I think that younger kids today are at a bit of a disadvantage because they're so used to digital communication and, you know, you miss a lot of important information through digital communication. Even with digital communication, though, a lot of these rules still apply. And I mean, I think the one that's really getting eroded by social media and the very uh, combative style that develops there is the the fourth step you indicated finding common ground this one seems to be the thing that has been lost more than anything everything's very adversarial so why is common ground important and second because i get this all the time how do you stay true to your own core values while finding common ground yeah those are great questions. And, you know, I'm a social psychologist and a personality psychologist, and I know there's a mountain of data out there in social psychology looking at uh, assortative traits. And that simply means that you have some, you found something in common with that other person. Uh, and it's so critical. I mean, that's really how alliances, relationships of all sorts, friendships, romantic relationships, that's really at the center of those finding that common ground. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to find, but it's there. You just, you, you have to keep digging in some cases, but you can find something that you agree with, uh, with that other person. Um, you know, it, it, a lot of times that stuff is hidden and you, you don't know it until later in the conversation or even several conversations down the road. Like, um, you know, there's some people I was just talking to yesterday and they were complete strangers. We were at a restaurant and they were at the table next to us. And it came up somehow that we both 
like to go to the same city for vacations. And like, that's a great connection. Oh, okay. You go to that city or oh, you go down to Florida or you go to wherever. Um, so finding the common ground is often a really a vehicle for the rest of the conversation. It just, it just propels the conversation. Um, but at the same time, the second question you had was how do you be true to yourself? Um, it, it's finding that the, the secret is really finding that, that sweet spot between, uh, you know, being curious and also uh, being, being genuine, being true to yourself. So you don't want to pretend to be somebody that you're not. So you don't want to say like, oh, I'm so interested in that topic. If you really are not, if you really hate the topic, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, and it's a, you know, it's, it's a dance. It's a tricky kind of thing to figure out, well, who am I talking to? What I'm trying to get inside his head or her head and figure out what they, what they truly like, what do they think about me? And what, you know, what should I say? Should I just pander to them and say, mm-hmm. I agree with everything you you're doing and saying, no, I would be true to yourself, but also be open and be flexible and be willing to talk about things that, you know, maybe that's not your favorite topic, but uh, at least it's a start. All right, Kevin, I think a lot of people would agree that open and flexible are not exactly how they describe most people they talk to these days. I want to take a break and come back and talk about potential reasons why, why there's not just a lack of skills in modern communications, there's a lack of interest in making friends. When we come back on It's Not Therapy at nottherapyshow.com, Leanna at nottherapyshow.com is the email, or you can hit me up on socials, Not Therapy Show on X, Twitter, Instagram, and Threads. We'll be back with Kevin Bennett after the break. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on Asset Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. I am still talking to Kevin Bennett, PhD, social personality psychology professor and host of the Kevin Bennett is Snarling podcast. We're talking about talking to strangers. (laughs) The era of stranger danger is far behind us. Kevin, we're now in the generation of people saying, I'm not here to make friends. I've talked to people who are either just getting into university, just getting out of university. They've got the eye of the tiger. I love Rocky. They're not there to make friends. And I don't know if you've ever heard that, but okay, maybe that's not your primary goal, but friends sure help with everything else too. And Where do you think that mentality comes from? Is that just covering up nerves and how do people not lose sight of their main goal, but still recognize that that maybe not being besties with everybody, but being reasonably well regarded will get you where you need to go? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I have noticed that as well. And I wondered what what are the root causes of that? Mm. I, I don't think there's just one single thing, but um, you know, like at, at my campus or at, co- at colleges in general, you, you have a number of commuters, you know, students that don't actually stay at the dorms. Maybe mm-hmm. they're going to a school where, they, you know, they live at home or an apartment. And a lot of those students, I, those are the students I hear saying, you know, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here because this is expensive and I need to get through this as quickly and as efficiently as possible uh-huh. and get my career going. Uh, and I, I hear all that. And as an advisor and a professor, I say, yep, we're, we're going to you know, try to get you through the program as quickly as possible. But hey, remember to, to uh, enjoy the ride and enjoy some of the things that go along with it, which are you know, the friends and the, the um, other people in the program. And that's a, that whole side of the college experience is important as well. Uh, so we don't want to completely abandon that just so we can pursue our academic goals. Um, but I, I have seen that. And I, I think that, um, you know, I always tell students that pretty much no matter what career you go into, no matter what you major in, you're probably going to have a job that requires you to interact with other people in mm-hmm. some way, right? Meetings or whatever. And so I actually teach those skills in, in one of my classes where we just sit around and we have small group meetings and I have 
students take turns leading that discussion or leading that meeting because these young students don't know how to do that. They don't know how to just manage a, a meeting for half an hour. Uh, and it's something they're going to need to do. And, and I, I think that having conversations is a part of that whole skill set as well, the managing group dynamics and meetings. Yeah. And I, I want everybody listening to realize we're not, you know, we're not Zoomer energying this. It's not, there's nothing wrong intrinsically with younger generations. It's just for whatever reason, they weren't taught these skills the same way. I mean, I'm trying to think of when I, I was just sort of thrown in the deep end with that kind of stuff and made a lot of mistakes and came out the other side. That might be part of it, that making mistakes is seen as so dire now, especially socially. I mean, we have this whole social media cringe culture, that's cringe, delete your account, all that stuff. It just seems like making a bit of a fool of yourself is a fate worse than death as opposed to something that happens to everybody. So what is something that someone can do to put themselves in a better headspace about the fact that that's going to happen? Yeah, and that's a great point as well. And I think it's because everything is being recorded to some extent mm. these days. You know, when when I was younger, I did so many things that were foolish and ridiculous and dumb. And I'm so glad that they they weren't documented in any way. Uh, and so I think that factors in. A lot of people think, you know, especially younger people, they think I cannot say something wrong or do something wrong because the the consequences are just magnified compared to what they they used to be. Um, and you know, there's a there's a term in, um, well, they use it in the in, in, diagno in, in diagnosing uh, psychological disorders, but mm -hmm. it's called psychasthenia, and it means that you are excessively worried about things in general, but especially interactions that you have with other people. And I, I think that's a big part of this. People have anxiety about starting conversations because they worry: what if I say the wrong thing? What if I just do something non-verbally that the other person picks up on and they don't like it. And so people that, that obsess about these things, they obsess about them long after the conversation is over. Mm -hmm. Like if you just have a chat with somebody walking across campus or down the street, Hey, how's it going? Oh, great day. Good day. Oh, I'll see you later. Um, you know, that's that you shouldn't have to worry about that conversation. It was just little, little chit chat, but mm -hmm. there are some people that do, they'll go home at night and they'll lie in bed and they'll think about that 30 second conversation they had eight hours ago. And, uh, uh, that's that's not good. We need to be able to just have conversations and just move on and have more conversations. Now, what? why does that happen in the brain? I know there are different modes in the brain, like different pathways based on whether you're at rest or whether you're focused on the task. But these things that drive us crazy do have a purpose. So what I'm trying to get at here is how can someone understand what's happening to them when they're you know ruminating or obsessing over something, how, how do they turn that into a positive use of the brain the way it's supposed to work as opposed to what they've currently got? Yeah, uh, well, that's a really interesting question. And I, the first thing I think of when you, when you talk about the brain and uh, conversation anxiety, I think of the amygdala, which is yeah. a structure in the brain that is about the size of a walnut. And if it's operating in a normal way and it's healthy and it's the right size, it's not shrunken down. You know, most of us have a normal amount of fear and we get in situations where our mm -hmm. danger detectors go up and we go, well, this is scary. And it can be a physically scary thing, you know, threatening, uh, like watching a scary movie or being on a roller coaster, but it can also be activated whenever we have conversations or the thought of a conversation with a stranger. And I think some people have uh, hyperactive amygdala. And so whenever they feel like they're getting close mm -hmm. to a conversation or they think about all the possible outcomes of this conversation, what's going to happen if I open my mouth and actually talk to this person? I think their amygdala is firing and it's sending a signal that's like fear, 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 danger. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's not good because we shouldn't have danger detectors going off when we're just having a conversation. Now, if somebody's following you in the dark on the way back to your car, that's sure. a good time when you know, but I, I think for some reason, 
uh, more and more in, in our culture, the danger detectors are going off for little things like a, mm -hmm. like a conversation, which should not be a big deal. It should not arouse a ton of fear, but it, it does in some people. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, I'll, I'll end with a story that kind of um, uh, um, example of this is we finally went back in class for this lecture I do once a term at, it used to be at Sheridan College, it's now at University of Toronto, pretty prestigious, right? Oh my God. Uh, yeah. It's always awesome when you get invited to speak at a school that wouldn't accept you as a student. So that was a bit right. of a, yeah, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, oh my God. And it was a brand new campus, which also happens to be the shooting location for Gen V, the boys spinoff, which, all right, interesting there. But I go huh. in and it it's it's nine o'clock in the morning class, the doom slot, right? And the parking's awful. The campus is under construction. I'm flying into this room full of fairly elite students. I've been rushing. I'm sweaty. I'm all over the place. I come in in this big flap and I was like, oh my God, this is happening. And uh, <laughs> I had to lecture on gender and game design too, which everybody loves the feminism course in, a, in, a, in an open class, right? But I just thought of myself as Doc Brown from Back to the Future, you know, the Christopher Lloyd mm. character. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Everywhere in a, like everywhere in a tizzy and everything's flying all over the place. And it's like, all right. If this is going to be a hot mess, this is going to be the best hot mess I possibly can be. And part of my brain was going, I'm this sweaty, creepy old lady talking to these very nice kids who are finally back in school after years of isolation. But then I realized, you know what? Everybody's probably feeling a little bit awkward as well. And so I, I find that's the thing that helps more than anything is not picturing it as, I'm awkward. I don't know what I'm doing. Everybody else does. Nobody knows what they're doing when it comes to talking to strangers, right? Yeah, exactly. And if, yeah, if you, if you put, if you cast yourself in the role of, well, everyone's an expert, but me, then that's not going to go well. But if you mm -hmm. say, Hey, everyone's in the same boat as I am, and we really don't know what we're doing. And I, I don't think I think one of the fears that people have is that they're being judged, right? Somebody's judging me. They're mm -hmm. going to be critical of me. And I just don't think that's the reality. And I don't think most people are critical going into conversations because we're both worried. Well, I'm talking to this brand new person. What's going to happen next? Uh, so if you both, if you just assume that you're both kind of worried, then that, that sometimes takes, takes the anxiety down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because, hey, we're, I mean, even the best conversationalist on the planet has a bad one every so often. They just get someone who's so not interested, sometimes trying to take you down a peg. because Oh, you're a big expert. I'm sure you've gotten this. I know I have that somebody just tries to chip away at your area of expertise just because reasons. And so the outcome of conversations is not entirely within our control, meaning there's only so much responsibility we can have for it. So last question, when something doesn't go great, when there is an awkward conversation or an actively bad one, how do we know what part was on us and what part was just, well, you, that person was a grouch that day. They may be a fine person, but they were just having an off day. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to tell people, Hey, just assume it's the other person, right? Okay. Just assume it's the other person. Uh, and you keep doing, if you're true to yourself and you know, you, you've had nine conversations that are all really good, but then the 10th one didn't go so well. I say, don't worry about it. There's probably something going on with the other person. I would try it again, you know, down mm -hmm. the road with that person and see how it goes. Um, you know, so in some ways it's, it's an issue of sample size, right? You're just talking to one mm -hmm. person and maybe it didn't go well. I would just say, don't worry about that. That's just a, a sample size of one. You need to have more conversations with that individual to get a more complete picture. So don't blame yourself. Uh, and you don't need to blame the other person. You don't need to blame anybody. Just say, Hey, sometimes conversations don't go as, as wonderfully as we had hoped. And that's okay because there's nothing that says every conversation has to be a perfect one. 
um, it's, it's fine to have bad conversations. I mean, one of the things I like teaching, uh, one of the reasons why I like teaching live to a group full of students face to face is because they get to see me stumble over words mm -hmm. because it's not like I stand up and I'm the most eloquent speaker in the world. And, you know, I'm just, I'm not, I'm, I'm a teacher and I'm trying to share some knowledge, but sometimes I have slow days or bad days where I can't think of the right words. And, uh, I, I think of teaching as a conversation. So I, I think my example works here, but some days it just doesn't go well. And you go, oh, well, let's try it again tomorrow. Don't worry too much about it. It's just one conversation. I'm going to display that right now because I messed up your first name in the intro twice. So on the outro, I'm going to try to get it right. Kevin Bennett, PhD. There we go. Teaching professor of social personality psychology at Penn State University. Host of Kevin Bennett is Snarling, a psychology podcast for chronic overanalyzers. I did it. I got it right this time. That was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I just had to slow down and enunciate. <laughs> Kevin, thanks so much. Where can people find more? Just search Kevin Bennett is Snarling anywhere they get their podcasts. That's right. Kevin Bennett is Snarling. That's Perfect. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking with you again. When we come back, I want to close up final thoughts on conversation. What to do when they go wrong? I think that's an important thing to talk about. I teed it up off the top, but now we've got how to start. Then what happens when you hit a bump after this on It's Not Therapy, Ad Not Therapy Show? website liana at not therapy show.com or at not therapy show on x former twitter instagram and threads talk when conversations go wrong after the break on it's not therapy the following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions if you're seeking social services please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kirsner. I'm still not a therapist. And for this final segment, I want to pick up where we left with Kevin regarding the fact that everyone makes mistakes. A frequent thing I hear from clients is that they have a history of catastrophes occurring whenever they make a simple mistake. Now, that's more of a feeling than a fact. It's probably not every time. It's just happened enough that it feels like it. But... As Kevin said, we all do it. We all make mistakes. And the inevitability of making a mistake fills some people with dread. But there are different kinds of mistakes, right? A lot of neurodivergent people have had bad experiences with their entire personality being judged by their autism, ADHD, or other condition. Even people who haven't been formally diagnosed, if you're branded socially awkward... Every bad deal gets treated like your fault. And believe it or not, I totally get that. I was so introverted and shy as a kid that I was diagnosed with social anxiety disorder as a teenager. Now, it was a misdiagnosis. I had trauma. I got really good at masking, but eventually I couldn't outrun it. And part of what I had to confront in trauma therapy was the fact that sometimes social situations are going to blow up. And sometimes I am going to be painted as the bad guy. And sometimes a whole bunch of people are just going to drop me and ostracize me. And it's never really fair. The system I developed to deal with this is a form of radical personal accountability. So I can be reassured that no matter what happens, I know I was fair, even if the other people weren't. Like I said, I was thrown in the deep end regarding talking to strangers. Don't ask me how I ended up as a journalist, because I remember a time when talking to strangers did exactly what Kevin described. Triggered the danger center in my brain. It was my authentic love of music and video games and eventually mental health techniques, or as I put it to Kevin, why does that happen in my brain that allowed me to overcome the terror and potential disaster of going up to people and shaking their hands? My husband started calling it Lois Lane mode. Apparently, there were times I actually stuck my foot indoors and got in people's faces to get answers to questions. Now, I have no memory of this. 
it was clearly some sort of dissociative state. It still is, I guess, but I do it. I did it. Now, mental health professionals are, as a rule, a lot nicer than media industry people, easier to get talking than other game developers, and a lot nicer than people on social media. But every so often, I get somebody, it just goes horribly wrong. I also have social interactions that go off the rails. Like I said, because reasons. And this is why I have the top 10 phrase, perfect is a lie, stop trying to be perfect. I was pleasantly surprised to hear Kevin's advice that you should just assume the problem is the other person. Because, yeah, I come from that background where every bad experience was somehow my fault. It's also a really self-conscious thing to do a podcast and a radio show with long COVID where one of the symptoms is period of extreme dry mouth. Yeah, let's not think about that. Let's just move on. I've also done stand-up comedy where everyone bombs sometimes. And I worked in the media at a young age. So yeah, some of my worst moments were recorded and broadcast. Yeah, if you want an expert on supremely screwing up and living to tell the tale, I'm your person. This is why it's good to have some older friends. We're the only ones you can speak from experience that you will outlive your mistakes. Make your public face an image that incorporates mistakes. In my case, so many mistakes. <laughs> If someone uses a vulnerability against you, that is their failing, not yours. We all have vulnerabilities. Show smaller ones early and often to other people because if someone uses those little things against you, they should probably be excluded from your social circle so that they don't use the big things against you. Another thing, if you're funny, lean into it. Don't worry about the people that don't get it. I am hilarious. I am both funny haha and funny strange. Yes, my funny is not to everyone's taste, but even the people who hate me get entertainment value from hating me. Leaning into jokes makes it easier to smooth over those awkward moments, those faux pas, those whoopsies that we all do. Speaking of those whoopsies, Admit when you've made a mistake. Because a huge portion of my sessions are over Zoom or audio calls, I sometimes forget, a client's blind, and I'll say something like, look at this from another perspective. Bless my clients, they'll say, I can't, I'm blind, and we'll have a laugh about it. The best moments, though, are when I catch myself right before I put my foot in my mouth, and it becomes funny. One client of mine has severe burn scarring to one of his hands, and I caught myself once right before I said, you have this reaction like you've touched a hot stove. I veered away at the last second by saying, you have this reaction like, and I almost used a completely inappropriate metaphor there. And he started laughing and said, I think I know which one it was. And it was like, yeah, and we both laughed. It turned a potentially awkward, hurtful faux pas into a validating moment because I saw, I validated, I was considerate. By the skin of my teeth. <laughs> with another client, I almost described learning a new thing as learning to write with your left hand. But at the last moment, <laughs> I remember the client was left-handed. That was another pretty funny moment. He thought so, not just me. Now, because I work with really sensitive subject matter and I do have to take some swings to find out what's going on with people, I'll often preface things with saying something like, okay, I'm probably going to totally mess this up. I don't say mess, but this show is clean. Sometimes I'll even be more forceful about it, saying to clients, okay, I'm going to say something and I want you to tell me where to go if it's wrong. Again, not exact translation. This show is clean. 
Doing this resets the balance of power in the conversation. It encourages communication and, well, frankly, it makes things more fun. Nobody wants to believe that another person is standing in judgment of them or telling them who and what they are. But sometimes I am way off. And authentic apologies go a long way. I'm very quick to apologize when I realize I did something wrong. I don't apologize just to smooth things over. So people know that when I say I'm sorry about something, it's sincere. Apologies matter. Apologies matter sometimes more than explanations. It's much better to say you're sorry than to make things a hundred times worse trying to avoid accountability because you're replaying something from the past where people wouldn't accept that you just made a mistake. But even with all that, not everyone's going to click with you. I'm a big personality. You may have noticed. And I'm not everyone's cup of tea. And that's okay. I don't need everyone to like me. And I work to see people who can't stand me as humans worthy of dignity anyway. And because of that, because I work to see the humanity in people that just make me see red, when someone treats me with a lack of dignity, I know that's on them, not me. Because in their situation, I would be working to not do exactly what they did. When you treat people well, no matter what, when you're open to different perspectives, it's much easier to see things as a them problem instead of a you problem when that good treatment isn't reciprocated. Now, I know my approach is in the minority. Good. You know, I'm not a big fan of normal. People will say things. People will do things. People will treat you poorly. That is on them, not you. You don't have to respond in kind, and you'll feel better long-term, less stressed, less worried if you just run your race, let other people behave the way they're going to behave. You behave the way you believe is right. Don't name call. Listen actively. Ask follow-up questions. Make sure you understand that you're not just responding. And what Kevin said about sincere curiosity in people, you can be the shyest, most awkward, introverted person in the world because I am. And that curiosity will take you through. And we're out of time. If anything inspires a question, comment, or suggestion, Leanna at NotTherapyShow at NotTherapyShow.com. Join our mailing list there or at NotTherapyShow on X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, and threads. Hope you enjoyed the show. I did. Um, I've got a massive headache right now. Did you need to know that? No, but I told you anyway. Remember, you're crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you like this headache is hurting me. See you next time.